Okay, so now we're going to use our stoichiometry skills and our conversions with respect to uh, chemical reaction skills and our limiting reaction skills um, to tackle different specific uh, systems that are important in chemistry. And the first one that we're going to discuss now in this section are reactions that occur in an aqueous environment. We have a sense of what an aqueous environment is. We talked about uh, salts that dissolve in water, all right? <coughs> it turns out that all salts are soluble, all right? So all ionic compounds are soluble, but some are more soluble than others. And in fact, a lot of salts we will put in water and they'll disappear. And this is the scenario that we talked about earlier in the semester. It's not that the salt goes away, it's just that it breaks into its pluses and minuses. Some salts are what we call insoluble. Now I put insoluble in quotation marks because really what we should be saying, like a better word is slightly soluble because they do dissolve a little bit. And next semester we spend a lot of time calculating how insoluble salts dissolve. So it's a little bit of a misnomer, but it's because of what we see. So if I put a soluble salt in water, it goes away, it looks like it dissolves. If I put an insoluble salt in water, it looks like it just sinks to the bottom and it doesn't dissolve. It dissolves such a small amount that I couldn't see it with my naked eye. So we call it insoluble, even though really a better term would be slightly soluble. So it turns out what we can do is we can do reactions with soluble salts and we can mix them together and sometimes when we mix them together, we get something that is insoluble. So what tells us whether we're gonna have a soluble situation or an insoluble situation? Like before we even get to the reactions, we need to understand, okay, so when do I picture the ions floating around because the salt dissolved? And when do I picture, all right, that the solid is just not able to dissolve in any appreciable amount that we could notice it with our naked eye? When do we have things that are soluble versus insoluble, all right? To uh, dictate how a salt behaves in water, we look at our solubility rules, okay? So now these are in your PowerPoints, okay? So this is um, in PowerPoint 4, all right? So the PowerPoint 4, Chapter 4, and this is Slide 2. So these are already present in that slideshow, so you should kind of pull them up. I just wrote them here for reference because the first time you see these guys, and they are slightly different than the ones in your book and the ones that Chem 101 will show you, although they get you to the same spots, they get you to the same answer. The first time you look at these solubility rules, it looks a little bit confusing, all right? Here's how you use these rules, all right? If something fits one of these categories, then it's soluble, all right? There are some exceptions listed, and if it fits an exception, it's insoluble. If it doesn't fit any category at all, it's also insoluble. So the way that you read this solubility chart, and you only need this one chart, is that if it fits these rules, it's soluble, and if it doesn't, or it's an exception, then it's insoluble. And that paints the picture of the chemical behavior of that particular salt, of that particular ionic compound. So for example, rule number one here is anything with ammonium, right? Or a group 1A metal is soluble. So if I start to ask you questions like, or Chem 101 does, all right, is Na2S soluble or not? Here's our thought process. We try to look at the ions that are involved and fit them to a category, okay? I look for S and I don't see it anywhere, okay? But you have to look at both ions. So S isn't listed anywhere in my solubility guidelines, but Na is. Na is a group 1A metal. And if it fits a category, that means that it is soluble. So when I put this salt in water, we expect it to disappear. We expect it to dissolve into its ions and a dissolution to occur like we're familiar with, two Na pluses and an S minus two result, all right? What if I look at something like, uh, let's pick chromium, all right? Let's do chromium two sulfate, all right? Chromium, sorry, it's chromium two sulfide, chromium two sulfide, and ask ourselves, is this soluble? 
So you look for each one of these ions on this chart. Do you see chromium anywhere? Mm, no. Do I see S anywhere? No. If it doesn't fit the chart, then we know that it's not soluble. It is insoluble. All right. Insoluble. Sorry. All right. It's an insoluble salt. And we expect it to be a solid when we try to put it into an aqueous environment. It doesn't dissolve enough for us to not call it uh, uh, for us to not call it a solid. All right. This, because it doesn't fit the rules, is insoluble, okay? So what about something like KClO4? Okay, hold on a second. I know K is group 1A metal, all right? So it looks like it's soluble, but remember, you check each one of these. Where is my perchlorate? Perchlorate is there, all right? Oh, well, both these say it's soluble, but check over here. Always look for these exceptions. And remember, if it's one of the exceptions, then it tells you that, that it, then it tells you that it doesn't fit that category. And remember, these categories are for soluble species. So these exceptions tell you that this is insoluble, right? Insoluble. Right, insoluble. So hopefully you can see how to uh, use this. Um, potassium sulfate, K2SO4. Sulfates are soluble. I look for the exceptions with K. There are no exceptions with K. This is a group 1A metal. So for both those reasons, this would be soluble. But then if I look at PBSO4 lead 2 sulfate, all right, sulfates are soluble, but it fits an exception. So then this guy is insoluble, okay? So you're gonna practice using this set of rules, okay? And it just takes a little bit of work, but these are guidelines that you can use on your homework, on your practice, you know, in your quizzes. These are guidelines that you should have at the ready so that you can use to answer these sorts of questions because what we're going to do now is take two soluble solutions and mix them together. And when we do this, we get what's known as a double replacement reaction. And for double replacement reactions, what we have are two aqueous reactants. And so we have a beaker with something that's soluble here and a beaker with something that's soluble here, and we dump them together. And what happens is you get two products all right. Now, there's a special type of product that could result. If one of the products is a solid, all right, we call that solid a precipitate. Because it looks like we had two beakers before that didn't have any solid in them, and then we dump them together and this solid manifests. This solid that would manifest, okay, is due to this precipitate being insoluble, right? Insoluble, right? So I'm just gonna draw a quick little picture to hopefully get this idea. And precipitate reactions are the first type of double replacement reaction. And double replacement reactions are about two aqueous species making two products. And then what we do is we analyze those products to look for things like precipitates, things like gas formations or liquid formation, and honestly, we're gonna look at only two types of double replacement reactions this semester. And one says, okay, for these two products, we look for a solid, okay? So here's a beaker and here's a beaker, all right? And inside these beakers, they have different ions, all right? Here's a bunch of pluses floating around here and negatives floating around here. And notice that they're not attached to each other. So this salt in here would be soluble. Over here in this beaker, we see the same thing, but it's a different salt. So here's a plus, and here's a minus. Okay. Now what we do is we take those beakers, I'm gonna give myself a little bit of room, you can draw down in your notes. We take those beakers and we dump them into the same 
area. We dump them into the same volume, into a larger beaker. Well, now what can happen is, all right, over in this beaker before we do the dumping, all right, we decided that this was soluble, all right? When this purple and this red try to find each other, we look at our solubility chart, all right? And it says, nope, they like to be soluble. They don't like to form a solid. They float away as ions, all right? Same thing over here with this green and this orange. Soluble, they're not touching, they're not attached together, they're not staying as a solid. But when I dump these together, now it gives you the possibility of the purple finding the orange. And maybe when the purple finds the orange, maybe it is insoluble. And so maybe that purple and orange will start to form a solid at the bottom of the beaker as they become attached, right? And they no longer stay dissolved, right? Maybe the same thing happens with the green and the red, or maybe the green and the red, they still just float away from each other. We look at our solubility guidelines, and the green and the red don't really do anything, okay? Maybe this is the case, but again, our solubility guidelines will tell us, okay, maybe the green and the red would still produce a soluble compound, and they remain up in the solution and they don't form a solid, right? When these guys crash together because of the new combinations that are possible, right? This guy we refer to as the precipitate. If you look at what green and red did in this little cartoon, it didn't do anything, okay? These guys weren't involved in any change at all. It was a red floating by itself before, a red floating by itself after. A green floating by itself before and a green is floating by itself is after, right? These guys we refer to as spectator ions because all they're doing is watching, all right, what actually occurs. They're watching the actual chemistry. They're not actually involved. Like a spectator watching a sporting event. They're not involved in the sporting event, but they're watching it. It's the same idea here. So with this simple idea, all right, with this simple cartoon in mind, we can start to now make predictions of products. In the context of double replacement reactions, we can start to decide, if I just give you two reactants, what the possible products might be and whether a reaction occurs or not. And I'm going to talk more about that in a bit. But let's take a look at something like, as an example, lead to nitrate. Right, which is aqueous by our solubility rules. If you look at our solubility rules, it'll tell us that nitrates are soluble, right? And let's do lead two nitrate, so let's put the two there, okay? Lead two nitrate, and let's react it with uh, potassium uh, sulfide, potassium sulfide, which would also be aqueous because, all right, it is bonded to a group one A metal. The S minus two is bonded to a group one A metal. So this is like the beaker over here by itself and the beaker over here by itself, and they're free-floating ions. So what we can do with a double replacement reaction is we can make a prediction. We can plug, uh, sorry, pour these guys together into one big basin. And now the PB, it has a chance to hit the S. Well, I know the PB over here is plus two, and the S over here is minus two. So one PB and one S would give me a balance uh, molecular formula. So PB plus two and S minus two, they come together. Now, is that going to be aqueous or is it going to be solid? I also know that the K and the NO3 can come together. Okay. Now a K has a plus one charge. Remember, it's really aqueous. You kind of have to view this as it's dissolved species, like that cartoon I drew. All right. NO3 just has one minus charge. So when a K and an NO3 come together, all I need is one of each, right? Now, before we consult our solubility rules, we don't know these states, okay? So we can go and we can look up those solubility rules now. Let's do this one first because it's a group 1A metal and it's a nitrate. If you look at those solubility rules, it fits the categories. And so we write it as aqueous. If we look for PB attached to an S on our solubility rule, PB plus 2 is there, right? But is it ever in reference to PB plus two attached to an S? 
Well, no, PB plus two is like attached to, I think like a CL or an I or a BR or an SO4. This is not part of our actual um, structure of our rules. It's not one of our categories. None of those rules say PB and S attached to each other are soluble. So that means that this guy is solid. This tells me that this is my precipitate, right? That's my precipitate. There's one thing wrong with this as we've written it so far, and we are violating the law of mass conservation at this point, okay? And so what we have to do then is we have to make sure we balance things, all right? Remember, it's all about thinking about these ions coming together, 1K, 1NO3. Oh, but this side has two NO3s and two Ks. I'm gonna put a two out in front here. And then everything is balanced. We call this the full molecular equation. And because a solid formed, we say that a reaction happened. And actually that cartoon we drew, this is exactly this sort of example that could relate directly to that cartoon. Things were aqueous before, things were aqueous before, we dumped them together and now we had a solid, All right? This is the full molecular equation. Okay. Let's take a look at another example. And let's do uh, Li2O aqueous plus NaCl aqueous. Okay. Let's predict the products. Let's write a balanced reaction. And let's also predict, all right, the states of the product. So just like our last example, just like our cartoon, what we kind of do to predict the products is we look for things that could possibly be switched. And what I mean by that is, remember, this is a beaker by itself. This is a beaker by itself. We pour them together. Now the Na might bump into the O instead of the Li, right? And now the Li might bump into the Cl instead of the Na, right? So one way to predict products, the easy way, is to find the positive things and switch them, okay? So when an Na attaches to an O, how does it do so? Well, Na has a plus one charge and O has a minus two charge. So when Na and O try to attach to each other, you need two Na's for one O. What about Li and Cl? Well, Li is plus and Cl is minus. So when these guys come together, you get LiCl, okay? We can now look on our periodic table, and I'm just gonna give myself a little room here for a coefficient if I need it. We can now look on, sorry, our solubility rules. We can look at our solubility rules to decide what these states are. This is a group 1A metal, and it's not one of our exceptions with group 1A metals like K, uh, C2H3O2, okay? So this is a group 1A metal, so it's aqueous. This is also a group 1A metal, so it's aqueous. So what happened here, all right? We can go ahead and balance this guy, we would need a two here, and we would need a two there. And hopefully you can see why. But what happened here? I had a beaker of this, I had a beaker of this, I poured them together, and did I get a precipitate to form? Well, no, it looks like nothing happened, and that's what you would see, just so you make sure you understand. It was a beaker of LiO, Li2O. It was a beaker of NaCl. We put them together, and did we see any solid form? No, everything stayed aqueous. Everything was a spectator ion. So nothing really happened, right? And in fact, we need to know that these situations are classified as no reaction. Nothing formed. There was no precipitate that manifested. So no reaction occurred. And you might see this labeled as NR, no reaction. So a really important point is when you do your switching and you consult your solubility rules, you have to make sure that a solid forms to say that a reaction occurred, right? Along those lines, we write what are known as total ionic equations and net ionic equations, right? And what these ionic equations do is they help us see the actual chemistry. Remember, we're writing things as aqueous, and we know that aqueous really means not attached anymore. 
And so what we do to make a total ionic equation is we write all the aqueous species in their ion form, okay? So let's go to like an example. Let's do, um, let's do AgNO3, which is aqueous, and KCl, which is aqueous. We put these together. And what we get is AgCl, which is actually a solid. It's one of the exceptions in the Cl rule. And then we also get KNO3. And I'm running out of room, but this is aqueous. So this shows you a full balanced molecular equation. Okay. Well, let's write down what the actual sort of ions look like. Let's write down what these species are sort of how the species look in those little cartoons that we drew. Because if this is aqueous, is it really AG attached to NO3 anymore? No. So I'll say it one more time because it's important. Make sure you write it down. From a full molecular equation, to get a total ionic equation, we find all the aqueous species and we write them in their ion form. So how would AG NO3 look, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of its ion form? It's really an AG plus floating around as aqueous, and an NO3 minus floating around as aqueous. KCl is aqueous. What does it really like in term, look like in terms of its total ionic form? Well, it really looks like a K plus, that's aqueous, and a Cl minus, that's aqueous. Now I'm gonna draw the products down here because I'm running around out of room. What about AgCl? Hold on a second, we decided that AgL was a solid. How do we get a total ionic equation from a full molecular equation? We take the aqueous species and only the aqueous species and write them in their ionic form. Ag and Cl are stuck together. So we keep them stuck together in this step. Now KNO3, that is aqueous. So anything aqueous, we break down. Now this really fits with our cartoon because notice what it looks like. It looks like Ag plus floating by itself, NO3 minus floating by itself, K plus floating by itself, and Cl minus floating by itself. Pour them together, you make AgCl solid, and K plus is still floating by itself, and NO3 minus is still floating by itself. And just like a math equation, if I look on this side of the equation and this side of the equation, it looks like I could cancel these guys. It looks like nothing has changed with the K+. It looks like K plus must be a spectator ion. Same thing with NO3 minus. Now we can see that it wasn't involved in any change. Like AG and Cl, they definitely changed. It used to be AG plus by itself and Cl minus by itself, and now they're stuck together. But nothing about... K plus and NO3 minus changed at all. So what we can do is we can write what's known as a net ionic reaction. All right, and here's how you write a net ionic reaction. You get rid of the spectator ions. Net means, okay, we're looking at the net change. We're looking at the things that are actually important. And for this reaction, the net ionic would be Ag plus aqueous, plus Cl minus aqueous gives AgCl solid, okay? That's the actual important chemistry that occurred when I dumped these two solutions together, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. So I just wanna go over this one more time just as a quick little review, and then I'm gonna show you another type of double replacement reaction that still fits all this all these ideas in the exact same way. And so we can kind of just review all this again, but quick little review here, all right? We're given these reactants, take the positive things, switch them to predict the products. Look on our solubility rules to decide whether we're gonna have solids that form or not. We call those solids precipitates. To go from a total molecular equation to a total ionic equation, we find all the aqueous species and only the aqueous species and we write them in their ion form. It's almost like you do a dissolution. Remember we were doing those problems earlier where we break apart the thing, right, into its cations and anions? You do the same thing here, and you follow all those same rules from earlier in the semester, all right? We keep the solid together, and then to get the net ionic reaction, we notice, oh, well, K hasn't really changed, 
NO3 minus hasn't really changed. You get rid of your spectator ions and it looks like Ag plus and Cl minus are coming together to form your precipitate. Okay. So to review this concept and also to introduce another important system, this is still classified as a double replacement reaction and we're gonna see why. Another thing that fits this general process, right, is an acid-base neutralization. This is a double replacement reaction. So what you have is an acid that is aqueous. Well, that kind of fit with our rules of acids from earlier in the semester. We knew that to have an acid, you had something start with an agent for it to be aqueous, right? We're also gonna have an aqueous base. Now, bases are uh, things that have an OH in them. So these also have to be aqueous, but they're essentially producing hydroxide in solution. So M is just standing in for a general metal or something that acts like a metal like NH4+. Plus. Okay, so we have to have these guys that have OH minus because OH minus is where we're getting our basic behavior. That's like our definition of a base, all right? And our definition of a base will change uh, as we get into more detail, probably next semester is when you'll see most of that, right? But these are double replacement reactions. So what we can do is we can look at something like H2SO4 aqueous, right? Plus KOH aqueous, and we can predict the products. Now for acid-base neutralizations, we don't need the solubility rules because this word, word neutralization tells us what's happening. At the end of the acid-base neutralization, okay, essentially what you have is water. Okay, so here's why. Remember how we do double replacement reactions. We find the positive things and then we flip them. And we try to see, okay, if I have a solution of this and a solution of this separately, and then I pour them together, now the K could possibly run into the SO4. Well, I would need two Ks to do that, to balance out my charge, okay? I could look for the solubility rules here, okay? So I shouldn't say you don't need the solubility rules completely, okay? Because this guy, is it something that fits our solubility rules? Yep, it's aqueous. But my point still stands that when I do the flipping here, the thing that acts like a metal over here is H. What is HOH, okay? So when I do my flipping and I have H attached now to OH, okay? I have HOH, which is H2O. So when an acid and a base come together, they neutralize each other to make water. To balance this out, I would need a two here. And then it looks like I'm kind of done, okay? if I write a two here as well, okay? On this side, I have one, two, three, four H's, and now I have four H's. I have two O's, I have two O's, yep, okay? For every OH minus, you need one H to neutralize it. Notice how we predicted the products, though. We did it in the exact same way we did for our precipitation reactions. Did we make something that was not aqueous? And the answer is yes. Now, will we call this a precipitate? No. But we do recognize that for sure, right, a reaction occurred because a change occurred, okay? And we could see that by writing a total ionic equation and a net ionic equation. So just like the other double replacement reactions we are looking at, here's our full molecular equation. Let's write a total ionic equation for this, all right? So what do I do? I do a dissolution. How does this guy dissolve? Remember, all the pluses and minuses come away from each other. So this looks like 2H plus aqueous plus SO4 minus 2 aqueous. I'm going to have, ooh, I have a KOH which breaks into a K plus and an OH minus, but how many KOHs do I have two? So when I have two of these break up, I get 2K plus aqueous plus 2 OH minus aqueous. On my product side, right, I have K2SO4. Okay, so do the K stay together? No. And, oh, yeah, okay, so I get 2K plus aqueous plus SO4 minus 2 aqueous. Well, that felt like earlier in the semester when I just did a dissolution, 
and my professor reminded me not to keep the subscript here and to make it a coefficient out in front. Remember all that? Well, it's going to come to play now for sure, right? Do I break H2O down in anything? Well, no. You only break down aqueous species to get a total ionic equation. So this remains 2H2O liquid. So we don't have a precipitate form, but we definitely have a reaction occurring because we make something that's no longer aqueous, no longer just an ion floating around. Can we get a net ionic reaction for right, this particular neutralization? The answer is yes. Do you see any spectator ions? Well, 2K plus is here, 2K plus is here. Has K changed at all? Absolutely not. Same thing for sulfate. Has the sulfate changed at all? No. So our net ionic reaction looks like 2H plus aqueous plus OH minus aqueous yields, oh, sorry, 2OH minus, yields 2H2O liquid. Is this a change? Well, yeah, H used to be by itself, OH minus used to be by itself, and now they've formed water. Can you see something we can do to simplify this to get full credit? There's a two, a two, and a two here. So honestly, the simplest version of this equation is found by taking out that common factor. And in fact, based off our definitions, for an acid-base neutralization, this is always the net ionic reaction. Because essentially it's showing you acids, which produce H+, and OH minus, uh, and bases, right, that produce OH minus, make water. And let me say that one more time just for clarity. I apologize. Acids which make H+, and bases that make OH minus, when we react them together, they neutralize each other to make water. Okay. What we're going to be doing in the next video is now applying mathematics to these scenarios because we have limiting reactant problem skills and conversion problem skills that we can now bring to bear in this environment where we can start with two reactants, predict products, right? get equations, and now also make predictions using limiting reactant type of problems or conversion type problems. And like I said, that'll be the focus next time.